Welcome back. Well, yes, indeed, uh, joining us this morning to weigh in on this ongoing security or insecurity challenges we've got in different parts of the country, as you've seen there, John Cardinal Onayekon, who is the Archbishop Emeritus of Abuja Archdiocese. Good morning, sir, and thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, there's been several interpretations of what is going on, how we're approaching it, what we should be doing, where we may be missing it. But let's get your uh, view first in terms of your impression of what really is going on about the insecurity we have at the moment. My, good morning, uh, my friend and brother. Good morning, viewers, too. <laughs> My impression would be probably what most Nigerians have. Uh, is impression in terms of uh, um, being surprised, taken aback, uh, that this cannot, we don't understand what is happening. We don't understand why these things should be going on. Uh, we don't understand that bandits and the, and the robbers and the terrorists, whatever name you call them, have been can be roaming around freely and escalating by the week, by the day, and it's as if the state is uh, has completely surrendered. I'm glad that there is a lot of movement now. And we, we are even hearing some right kind of things being said. And there is a, a sense of commitment, especially from the governors and so on, that uh, this should stop. I don't believe that it is beyond the Nigerian state to deal with. This is our country. And if all of us are together, I'm sure things will move faster. So my major concern is that are we on the same page? Are there people with any hidden agenda? What kind, is, is the government itself cohesive and united? And when I say government, I don't mean only federal government, but also state governments and local governments. And the rest of us who are citizens, we want to know what is happening so that there'll be no room for all kinds of conspiracy theories which confuse issues and make it possible to think together and act together. And so we are really, really confused and worried. My, my only hope, uh, the only uh, silver lining I'm seeing is that there is a general agreement that we should not be where we are. Therefore, something needs to be done differently from what we have been doing before. But in terms of uh, having a proper analysis of what the situation really is, do we all have to be on the same page for the right actions to be taken? Because if the federal government decides, look, this is how we want to approach some of these things, and they take the leading step, we can get some major results there, can't we? No, I'm talking, when I say common page, I mean common page as regards what we want to achieve. Common page as regards the assessment of what is happening to us. When it comes to what, what um, strategies to apply in order to achieve this common objective, there are ob there's obviously room for differences of uh, opinions and even different differences of tasks. We, are, we, are, we don't all have the same measure of responsibility or ability to deal with um, bandits and terrorists. But when it comes to admitting that we have terrorists in our midst, and let us be united in that, we, it doesn't help when we are hearing um, some places, some voices, uh, as it were, seeming to be uh, condoning and supporting what is happening. Uh, or whether on religious or on ethnic, ethnic basis. A criminal is a criminal, even if he's a Catholic. He will be a criminal, and I will denounce him as such. If we can have a common mind 
on what we want, that we want a nation united under God where men and women and children can go about their business and live their lives in freedom and in, in security. Then we can, and we can, and we, we agree on identifying those who are disturbing our nation. Then it is, we will be able to put our, our minds together and our resources together to tackle it. Uh, I'm not the only one who is uh, complaining that there are discordant notes. It is not good news when one when governor says one thing and another one counteracts it, or when a governor says something and the federal government counteracts it, and when uh, state government puts on security measures and the the, the, the Nigeria police refuse, does not does not key into the system, ref, indeed refuse to to um, to get the to get the the, the the project going. This is what we see from around, and it should not be happening in a nation that is supposed to be well organized and well governed. Well, you have uh, just right there from the comments you just made now about these discordant notes pointed to a major issue, which is we don't seem to have an agreement on something. Discordant notes among governors of the same region and of different regions, discordant notes between federal and state governments and even agencies and all of that. It points to something, but perhaps the challenge here, the real crux of the issue is we have not been able to pin down the real course of all of these insecurity challenges that we've been having. What, in your estimation, would you say is the reason while we are having these security challenges that had spilled over years. Uh, I don't know if there is any nation where there is no crime. Every nation has its own fair share of criminals, of bandits. It's only a matter of, um, of uh, how many how powerful, how strong. Our whole situation has become critical because it has gone beyond a situation of the normal kind of criminals elements that we have in this. Okay, well, certainly we'll have that um, uh, technology fixed and uh, have uh, his eminence back in this conversation that we are having because, I mean, uh, when we begin to have discovered cordon tunes among, or discovered notes, as he calls them, among the, 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 the governing class, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm torn between using the word ruling and governing. You know, governing, ruling sometimes suggests... Well, the elected <laughs> officials in this case, so, yeah. I mean... Um, I, uh, <laughs> it depends on how you want to use it now, a verb <laughs> or what. But, yeah. you know, part of what, what he's saying is that uh, all of those discordant tunes, um, you know, what we may also seek to find out from him is, uh, look, is this a facade, really? Because many sit back and if you look at the trajectory, or the, the, there's an established pattern. Mm. First, you could see the pattern in the space of kidnappings. I mean, you have uh, our security people who will always tell us, look, humans are creatures of habit. Mm. These things are not that you know, difficult to discern from what they have been doing, mm. from the actions that we've seen. So uh, do we all, or do they expect us all to believe that um, mm. the authorities don't have at least a huge amount of information mm. as to what is going on? Uh, if that is what people like us to believe, or the authorities like us to believe, then it, lay, it raises a lot more questions as to the security architecture, mm. which lots of people always like to refer to in terms of, um, okay, so what is going on here? But the comments from uh, the chair of NGF, perhaps we'll, we'll like to take on his eminence mm. on that one as well, um, he puts so many things in perspective. Mm you know, in terms of how um, some persons out there see certain things. And perhaps, uh, maybe that should help us all refocus. Mm. Say, okay, wait a minute, if this is what... Look, they've got a lot of information Absolutely. when they're up there. I mean, he's, he's been minister, 
and he is now governor. So it's two time or second time he is governor. So definitely he has access to some information. Yeah. And being chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum, you know, first among his peers, thirty six of them, most certainly something that you know he. Well, they all don't agree on so many things. Actually. Well, yes, they don't so. agree, or they, they all don't always agree. It's yeah, that's, I mean, that's the nature of democracy. You know, Ideas have got to contend. They, absolutely, they all don't always agree. But then, yes, he has this information, and for him to have said, you know, that these are symptoms or you know demonstrations or manifestations of terrorism, definitely is something of concern. But it, it'll also be good to find out from his eminence, you know, because at the end of the day, um, we talk a lot about what government has done, what government is doing, or what government will be doing or should be doing. It's, at the end of the day, it's about the people. It's the people that get killed. It's the people that are insecure. It's the people that are displaced from their homes. Yeah. Uh, it's the people that elected these people who are supposed to govern them and all of that. So uh, but what, what are these things that, what is it that the people are supposed to do. He's an elder statesman, so. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yesterday when the Plateau State governor was talking about uh, people shouldn't say government hasn't done anything or mm -hmm. nothing is being done. Look, there's no government that comes in and doesn't do anything. Absolutely. They always do something. Mm -hmm. But that is not the issue. The thing is, How the sufficient. kind of results that people How? see Absolutely. speaks a great deal to whatever it is that they have done. Mm. And unfortunately, the way it is with security is that no matter how good you, you have, may have performed, it's say in result. five years, six years, seven years, if there's one major blow or explosion and people die, there will be questions. Mm. Guys, it's like football. Pardon me to bring that You have now. come again. No, you know, <laughs> it's like football because if you've been winning laurels all the while, Look at Madrid, Real Madrid. You could win three successive Champions Leagues mm. or Champion Leagues, but if you lose 10 successive matches, chances are that the coach will be gone. So these are principles, really, not that, you know. Well, it's a good principle, but, you know, principle. another thing that will be added to this is part of the people that are most vulnerable in all of these are women and children. Yeah. And that's, uh, by the way, we have a woman among us. Malpe? Well, it'll be interesting to hear his eminence perspective on whether or not he thinks that there is a place for clerics in all of this. Uh, we've been saying only recently, Sheikh Ahmed Gumi, you know, going to the bushes to speak to the bandits. And in recent times, he's been asking for amnesty for them. I think uh, in the interview, he granted our colleague, Sheung Wo Kimbaloi, uh, he spoke on the reason. And I think that some of the papers have quoted extensively bits from that interview. So it'll be very interesting to know if his eminence thinks that there is a place for clerics in the middle of all of this. But something that really stands out for me is leadership. So interestingly, increasingly, Nigerians are looking to the governors, especially uh, the coalition of governors. If you're not looking to the Nigeria Governors Forum, you're looking at the Northern Governors Forum, looking to hear what they'll say as a block. And I think that, that speaks to the fact that they are not hearing from the main person that they need to hear from. Due respect to... Uh, Garbashehu and Mr. Femi Adeshino, uh, who are the president's spokesperson. But at this time, you know, one of the things that the people really need to hear is from the leader whom they elected to make sense, to really, you know, put a finger on what is happening, uh, to, to understand precisely what is going on and see if, uh, you know, what exactly the, the president is thinking in terms of whether amnesty is the way to go, negotiations are the way to go, or it's going to be a military solution. Because right now we have all manner of sight, um, and all manner of advice based on the perspective of whoever is touching this big elephant of uh, secu security that is now an elephant, you know, and all of us seem to be blind touching different parts. But it would be nice to know somebody who actually has all the eyes open and he has a bird's eye view of what is going on and, you know, can set the people aright as to what he believes the solutions are. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, I would like to know if the if his eminence thinks that there is a place for clerics in all that is going on across the country. Gentlemen.
Well, I'm not sure if you heard what is the question. So uh, perhaps uh, you could just go ahead. Uh, welcome back, Yemen and Sam. Did, did you get the question that uh, Marco just raised? Yeah, I was asking. I was asking whether there is whether I believe there is room for clerics in this matter. By by clerics, I mean I imagine you mean religious leaders. Yes. As you know, one of our problems in Nigeria now is that there is a major confusion as regards who are religious leaders, what do they stand for? It's so bad that I can only talk for myself and maybe the church to which I belong. But that apart, surely there is a moral issue here. Whoever becomes a bandit arms himself and um, uh, abducts innocent people on the road and put them through trauma. Certainly there is something wrong with that kind of attitude and behavior. And so there is problem in the heart, a moral issue which has to be dealt with. This is where definitely religion ought to play a positive role. It is also possible that uh, um, a criminal might uh, be uh, might be co convinced to change his attitude when he is spoken to, and when his heart is touched by the ministration of a genuine and respected religious leader. That is different from a religious leader becoming a, a, a channel for, um, for discussion with a criminal as if he actually has a, something to say. And I think in this, we need, to, we need to act together. There is a stage at which a religious leader can be very, very useful. I am not too familiar with um, our friend uh, Sheikh Gumi, he obviously has uh, a significant uh, uh, moral clout. If he's using it in, the, in a positive way to convert these um, criminals and make them stop what they are doing, then well and good, I will congratulate him and thank him for it. I don't have such a clout with those people all I can do is make statements and perhaps talk to my own uh, followers, those who um, who um, uh, listen to my uh, to what to my to, to listen to my preaching. And in these matters, uh, we have to distinguish between what a religious leader does and what the government and, and law enforcement agents should do. Uh, the, the law enforcement should not be begging criminals, but the, the religious leader can beg criminals to please stop. I don't know whether what I'm saying is uh, clear. Indeed, uh, it is um, clear what you're saying. However, do you see a role for intersection? Uh, because at the end of the day, what we have seen is that the Sheikh has come out and he's saying, you know, that there ought to be amnesty based on the perspective that he's gained uh, speaking to these bandits. Um, do you think that it's a route that government needs to explore in that regard? As we can see, there, there is a division of opinion over this suggestion of his. And I think that brings out the importance of transparency and the common discussion on this matter. We all have to agree on what to do. And uh, probably he, the, the Sheikh has taken a first step, but it should not be the end of it. Is the government really prepared to take the... Is the government really prepared to take seriously the spiritual uh, um, resources of religious leaders? In that case, they should make, they should prepare a, a sort of structure for that to happen. As at now, even what the Sheikh did 
was practically all on his own. And uh, uh, the, the more can be done in this regard. Lots of money is being spent in other areas. A little bit of that might be useful to bring together and uh, create the forum. And here, interreligious approach is very useful. Uh, so that it will not appear as if this is a Muslim thing or this is a Christian thing. Because the criminality itself is neither Christian nor Muslim, I hope. But increasingly, I mean, some people will say that this is deepening distrust amongst the two major religions in the country. Uh, what's your take on that? And do you see a room for reconciliation and healing and consensus building around the issues of security? Definitely, because... Security, good governance, good behavior, peace. These are all common grounds of all faiths, and especially the two major faiths in Nigeria. We are all agreed on that. This is all the more reason why we should work together. If, it, if action is taken or statements are made that tend to appear as if this is a Muslim thing versus others, then we may have, we may end up with the kind of scenario you are now describing, deepening of distrust. I would like to, to be able to, uh, to meet, for example, the Sheikh Gumi and discuss with him so that he can explain a little bit more to us what is happening. Why, what is exactly the, the line of action? Where do we all go, go, come into the picture? Because we are all affected. When terrorists and mad bandits kidnap on the road, sometimes they do ask whether you are a Christian or a Muslim, and probably they take action discriminately. But generally, they don't discriminate. So the matter concerns all of us. And in any case, we are all in this same country together, and we must join hands to rescue it. It all comes to well, how do we make sure that religion serves a positive, positive role in the present mess in which we find ourselves. Mm. On Over the weekend, you were on sparring in your comments uh, when you asked uh, those in government to get out if they are not, you know, if they have no clue on what to do to solve the security situation on the ground. Um, has your perspective changed or are you willing to give a little more time in terms of what you expect, given what has happened from the weekend till now? Thank you very much, Charles, for giving me an opportunity to clarify that press statement. You know very well how your, your journalists find a way of uh, um, bringing a sharp uh, headline to draw attention. I did not actually say that the government should quit, but I definitely said that, first, it is a primary duty of government to secure citizens. And when a government and reach a situation where it appears as if they can no longer carry out that role, then they must start, they must admit that they are unable to carry out their role. What I suggested was not that they should quit, but that they should open up the space, bring in other Nigerians, and that we, what we have here on our hands is no longer a case of APC or PDP. It's a question of the very survival of Nigeria. If I made any proposal at all, it is that we should open up the space of government. The government should not think that only they and their party members can handle this matter. They should open it up to the whole nation. There's no, no reason why um, everybody must be in the same political party. So that uh, I would like almost use a question like a, a government of national unity because we are in an emergency situation. How that will work out, that is the business of the politicians to work out. One thing is certainly sure, that we cannot continue the way we are going. You did mention that a few things are happening over the past week. 
I already said that those that is those are good points, so, some good signs, and we hope it will even go better and more seriously. The issue of cohesion, even on the part of government, is very, very important. It was raised from what I saw briefly in the meeting of governors in MENA, that they want we want a situation where the whole country is united against these bandits. Mm. We'll take a break here, Your Eminence. When we come back, we'll wrap up this discussion. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Well, Your Eminence, in terms of uh, this question of amnesty, how should we approach it? First, I mean, even listening to the recent comments from the chairman of Nigerian Governors Forum, where he says that these are terrorists. But we've equally seen uh, some members of the army, the uh, persons in the northeast who they say have repented, then they are rehabilitated back into the society. And then we've seen certain governors who are also given their perspective on how or who they think these people are. So should we be talking about granting them amnesty or proscription of terrorist groups? How should we approach it? From point of view of my own background, training and spiritual formation, I believe firmly in what uh, our scripture says, that it is not the will of God that the sinner should die, but that he should repent and live. So obviously, if uh, a, a criminal repents and sincerely repents, he should be forgiven. He should be forgiven. But the question is that when it comes to the real facts of the, has he repented or has he not repented, the state must have a way of uh, making sure that this is not uh, just a joke. The whole idea of, uh, call it amnesty, is not only to be applied to armed uh, bandits. In that case, it is true for everybody who is presently in jail in Nigeria. Anybody who is serving term in, uh, we now call it correctional homes, no longer prisons, but it's still the same thing. So, so um, the... If the world were wonderful and beautiful, nobody should actually be put in detention. Everybody should be able to go freely. But, but for the sake of law and order, to protect the rest of us, the few who are making life difficult have to be restrained. The, 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 bad, the, the mad dogs should be tied down. The armed, the armed bandits should be disarmed. So before we talk of amnesty or any of that, there should be clear evidence that there is a sincere repentance that the people concerned have, have, have decided not to pick up arms anymore, that they are ready to go back to their normal way of life. And if they are foreigners, they are ready to go back home to wherever they came from. All this must be part and parcel of the process of, uh, of uh, amnesty. There is also a difference between amnesty granted when it's a question of uh, differences of opinion, uh, political differences, when somebody has been put in jail for political difference, and then you give pardon. That one is easy enough. It, all, it, it means reconciliation. The bandit must be reconciled with society. They must change. They must decide to be really repentant and show it clearly and not go brag, not be put in a position to brag around as if to appear that they have actually won, they have defeated the nation and the state. This whole issue of, of, of um, uh, dialogue with them, I'll give the ex example, an armed robber enters my house uh, and is carrying a gun. I have to dialogue with him to beg him not to kill me and I allow him to take whatever he likes. Is that dialogue? Of course, we may call it dialogue. Now we need to do that so as to save my life. But the nation shouldn't be, should not reach that stage. I don't think we should reach a stage where the nation simply says we are unable to deal with the situation. We should be able to deal with it. And we, on the one hand, we should be open 
to, to amnesty, to forgiveness. On the other hand, we need to keep law and order and not make it a, an incentive for others to pick up arms and wait for amnesty and uh, rehabilitation. Um, this is what we have seen. I'm not, we, we don't have the full details of what happened in the amnesty program with Boko Haram. We don't have the full story. Uh, it seems to be crowded in security discussions. But what we are hearing is that many of the so-called the repented uh, uh, terrorists either went back to back to where they were before or are staying with us and supplying information to those in the bush. In other, that means they said they have repented, but they have not really repented. Is there a way of following up and make sure what what does how repented repentant they are? So these are issues that unfortunately is not so easy to deal with. But in in principle, in principle, the Christian religion is for forgiveness of the repentant sinner. And we are all sinners. We are all actually asking God to forgive us. Which, and we even say, God, forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. That The principle is clear enough. The issue comes when we have to face things in the reality on the ground. I, I do remember the former Minister of State for Agri, while he was in the National Assembly at some point, there were questions concerning who are these people carrying out all these attacks against farmers and the killings going on. And he said they were foreigners. But today we've heard uh, Kitty State Governor in that meeting in Niger State saying, look, kidnappers, this bandit, whatever you call them, these are terrorists, remnants of B. Iswap who have spilled into different parts of the country. And that then takes us to this point of uh, negotiation, either with kidnappers or whoever they are. Should we be, how should we approach that part? Because how then do we you know, distinguish between who are the foreigners? Is it the foreigners amongst them who are holstering the AK-47, carrying out this kidnapping? Should we be negotiating with them? What do you think we should be doing? How should we approach it? I think uh, there is no contradiction between what the former Minister of Agriculture of State said and what um, Governor Fayemi has said. Because it was, we have been told, I say we have been told because I have no first first hand information. We have been told that uh, the 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 effect the people in the Boko Haram uh, terrorist groups come from different countries, and especially different parts of West Africa. They we even hear that there are some um, some white people, many maybe maybe Arabs or maybe Europeans um, uh, among them. So it is not surprising. If indeed it is the Boko Haram element that has spilled over into the country, they will also have spilled over with uh, with uh, um, foreign elements. But what we are also hearing is that there is more than is more than that. That there are indeed, and this is serious, that there is indeed a, an inflow of of bandits and lawless people from our neighboring countries who are walking into our nation freely. And uh, carrying their arms without anybody, without self, any restraint, and are setting up camps in our forests, and and it is from there they are harassing the rest of us. So the matter is uh, even different from what we are having with uh, Boko Haram. Um, therefore, if you are talking of negotiation, with whom are you talking? Um, I have always asked myself. Have we ever really spoken with Boko Haram leadership? Again, again, I'm not in a position to know what is happening, since if anything ever happened at all, it has never been publicly announced to all of us. But generally, like we say, every war eventually ends up on the negotiating table. Yes, but before then, you must identify with whom are you negotiating, who are the leaders, who are those whom, after you have agreed with them, you can be sure that there will be no, everybody will fall in line. If we reach that stage where we can uh, meet, even outside Nigeria, like often, often happens, outside Nigeria, with those who are the real leaders of these groups, 
then we can negotiate. But if you are talking of bands of bandits who just organize themselves in small groups, 10, 12, and with very well armed, who just come in, commit criminal activities and go out, you can, you can negotiate with that little group. What about the rest? And after you finish with them, what stops them from moving to another place and go around, start all over again? So I think uh, in the area of negotiation, we must distinguish between when you are dealing with an organized group, like it seems Boko Haram is organized, and bandits that are just coming from different places. Apparently, uh, the, uh, Nigeria has become known to be a place where you can just go and steal and get away with it. So maybe that is attracting more and more people from other parts of our sub-region, which is a, a pity. We, we, welcome, we welcome foreigners, but and we have always welcomed them. It's only when they begin to be, a, a, to be a, a danger to our own survival that we need to shout in self-defense. Well, perhaps that also underscores what the federal government is considering now about the ECOWAS protocol to review some of it so that people don't just saunter in and out of Nigeria uh, willy-nilly without, you know, doing the proper things. But then when you talk about and reference... I am surprised. Sorry, permit me, to, permit me to bump in here. Okay. I'm surprised. I'm surprised to hear that because... I've, take, I've tried to travel to, uh, across West Africa several times, taking my car or, a dry, or in the bus. We're traveling from Lagos to Semeboda. So before we get to uh, uh, where to meeting in Ghana, the amount of check we get on the way is so is it's so much that I don't understand why it is not the same thing all across our borders. So it is not even. It seems that even what we are complaining is that the ECOWAS protocol, which talks about free movement of of people and goods, when it comes to the reality on the borders, we see something else. Mm -hmm. So there is a there must be the fact that some people are not doing their job, or shall we say the borders in the north don't are not along the roads where the the uh, immigration officers are, and therefore it becomes practically and physically impossible to guard our borders. That is a serious matter. But we are not the only ones who have uh, large borders to guard. We should know what to do to prefer, prefer that. There's a whole question, too, of identity. There are countries in this world, even in West Africa here, where people are supposed to go around with their identity card to be sure you are who you say you are. We have not had that kind of... Uh, habit here in Nigeria, but I'm, I'm glad that we are working in direction of national identity cards so that you know who you are. If I arrive in uh, Ghana tomorrow, I cannot pretend to, that I'm a Ghanaian. Uh, unless still, if I go to Italy where my black color already tells them that I am not an Italian. But if I get to Italy and I, and I show my Vatican passport, they will know that I have a right to be around here. So these are issues which I think is not rock science. If we are negligent in, um, in, um, in uh, keeping our borders safe, we should simply admit it and take steps to rectify the situation. Uh, the borders that you talk about is actually something of concern to a very, very good number of people. And perhaps, of course, from what you have also said, you are as concerned. But the, the, the question that I was going to ask you is along the line of how we involve the people in the exercise. You have talked about the official borders, the ones that are guarded by the NCS, the immigration, and the rest of them. But there are several thousands of borders with thousands of communities all across the nation, all across Nigeria. And I'm just wondering what kind of conversation should we be having with these communities and their leaders? Because there have been times when a good number of people have also said that some of the infiltrations we are having is because, you know, some 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 Nigerians are colluding with, you know, some of these elements who come into the country. So it, it, it begs the question of how we involve Nigerians in these border communities, in the local communities, 
in fighting for and defending the integrity of the nation because as you know and as has been said by the former head of state the military apparatus are overstretched so what kind of conversation should we be having with these locals so that they can also join in protecting nigeria from these infiltrations uh, we we talk as we talk as if we have uh, never uh, lived in a nation where the borders are relatively well protected. We, we still remember now, not too long ago, the borders were well protected. Why are we making? Why are we angry? Why are we worried and disturbed today? Because uh, it has uh, the movement of people, and especially the movement of criminals have taken a new dimension. It, we have to distinguish movement of people and movement of criminals, armed criminals. Uh, the, I have, uh, we, are, we hear once in a while, when the border communities raise alarm that there are some individuals in our forest who are armed and are harassing people, they don't get much attention paid to them. And very often, those border communities are even the first victims of these invading marauders. I think this is where the issue that has been raised over and over again, that the security should be not only from Abuja, but also to the states, and then right down to the local government becomes very important. If every local government has its own uh, uh, security apparatus, it can be the first line of response to this kind of thing. And then uh, these communities along the borders should be given special attention and special uh, 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 resources to be able to join the uniformed uh, immigration officers in protecting our borders from bad people who are coming into our country. We have enough of our own robbers and bad people. But to have a situation where they are coming in large numbers, like they are now coming, is not acceptable at all. As you probably know, they are one of part of the of the conspiracy theories going around is that uh, this movement of armed people into Nigeria is not uh, by chance, and that they are being sponsored, being imported, being uh, helped and even protected. Now, this kind of theories is making the Iran cities dangerous. And if anybody's in a position to uh, stop it, the sooner, the better. Because uh, what is happening is not sustainable. So it is not only a matter of movement across the borders. Nigerians also move across the borders. And we have never complained too much about that. But when you have organized gangs, armed, moving across the borders, we should be able to deal with that. Well, that also raises the question of um, community policing and state police. That has been an issue that, uh, in, in the news for quite a while. While some people believe that, you know, I mean, the, the federal government is coming up with the idea of community policing, hoping that that would help to stem the tide of insecurity at the lower levels. But then they are still being centrally controlled from the from the, the, the federal capital. But while at the same time, governors have joined their voices, among several others, to ask that we tinker with our laws so that we can permit the governors of the states to control their own police apparatus so that we can be able to stem the tide at the local levels that you talked about. What's your take on that? My take on it is that we need more than tinkering with our laws. We need to overhaul our laws, not just tinkering with it. Uh, this is one area where the, the contradictions of our present constitution is very obvious. The constitution says that the governors are the chief security officers of their states. But de facto, what happens? When, they, when their state is in trouble, they don't have the wherewithal to, to carry out that role of chief 
security officers of their states. And even if there are security uh, uh, security uh, um, structures within their states, like the police, which is a federal police, or army, which is in, in, the, in their state, they have no direct control over those uh, apparatus, which means the law itself doesn't make sense. If the governor is to be the chief security officer of his state, he should be able to have men and equipment at his disposal that he can use when it is when there is need. And I'm saying that we should go beyond that local government should be organized now better in such a way that the local government should also have apparatus and personnel to be able to deal with some measure of security within the area because people, they know one another very well. So I, I agree with you. And it's not too late now we are saying it. It has been said over and over again. I don't know who doesn't want this constitution to be improved because too much of it just doesn't work. There is need to change it. And, uh, and we, we definitely need, we may not need the state army, but we certainly need state police. Is that part of uh, the, the, does that suggest you're su supporting the call for restructuring the country? Yeah. Call it whatever you like, whatever, we, whatever you like. When people who are talking of restructuring means that the structure on ground is not, is not sustainable, is not, is not working for us. It has to be, and it takes various forms. Some people talk of restructuring in terms of um, bring, making the states more uh, autonomous in respect of the, of the center. And autonomy includes also uh, financial uh, autonomy. This is obviously the direction to go. How, we, how that goes is still being worked out. There is a fear that the issue of constitutional review is very is bedeviled with all kinds of problems. There are those who are even suggesting that um, those the constitution itself has made its review very difficult, almost impossible, when it puts the onus of reviewing the constitution on the members of the National Assembly. What happens when you have a National Assembly that no longer has enjoys the confidence of the people, and it is still the same assembly that is expected to to review the constitution for the people. So there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of issues. Uh, uh, it is a sad fact that very often the way the National Assembly moves doesn't seem to uh, go in tandem with the way most of us around are feeling. And uh, you can say we have an opportunity at the elections to change them, but uh, we know that that is very often not even the case considering the quality of elections we have been having so far in our country. We do hope that those who are in the assembly will realize that they represent us and find out what we want and make sure that they, they do represent us well there. May God bless those of them who are doing well in this regard, but so many seem to be there playing political games and uh, their anxiety being hard to return in the next election. And so uh, the situation in the country is beyond that now because if they don't work hard, there will be no national, national assembly to talk about when chaos descends, which God forbid. All right, then, uh, Your Eminence John Cardinal Onayiko, Archbishop Emeritus of Abuja Diocese, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Thank you very much for giving me opportunity to air my views. May God bless our country, Nigeria. We are a great nation, and I believe God loves us. God bless you. Amen. We're back in a moment.